Hello and welcome back. Uh, this is episode two. I'm Awan Ilsar, and last time we were thinking about how we can combine acoustic music and electronic music in live performance. And I'm sure you came up with some incredible and wacky ideas about where the future of music could be going. Um, I had a similar moment in my career when I was in my early 20s and I was thinking, how do I combine this uh, skill set I have as a live drummer with this love for electronic music? And luckily for me, I met an incredible composer who's also a great computer coder. Uh, his name's Mark Haverleaf. And the first time I saw him, he was actually wearing a jacket that had these sensors in them. And he was just kind of stand, sitting at a laptop while the band was playing. And he could manipulate the sounds of the rest of the band through moving in not very dance ways, I'm sure he could agree, but in a way anyway. It was like this um, wonderful to see the sound kind of go into his arms and back out through the speakers in a sense. And I had already had an idea that I wanted to build a hat <laughs> that would allow me to, while playing drums, electronic drums, be able to manipulate the sound of those drums with my head because it was the only part of me kind of left to move when you're moving your feet you're moving your arms and he stepped up he very quickly built me a hat that I could wear at gigs uh, that would send information about the orientation of my head for those who might know chaos pads or I guess now iPhones or iPads that we can just touch and have an X and Y coordinate same thing was being used with my head. At first, the sensors we used were mercury tilt sensors. So the mercury would just kind of slowly go in one direction and then boop, tell the computer, yep, the mercury's touched that side of the sensor, send a bit of information. And we had several of them, so at different stages, they would all switch on at different times. Uh, and then we stepped up and started using what we call accelerometers. And we have those in our phones, they're more complicated to, for me to describe, particularly. Uh, and we did some performances with this hat. It was maybe changing the delay on my drums or the pitch of the drums. And after a couple of performances, I went, this is not very good for my neck. This is really hurting after a show and maybe this is not a healthy approach to making electronic music and incorporating it with acoustic music. So we stepped back, me and Mark, and kind of thought, well, what is another way of doing this? And we realized there's so much movement that you create as a drummer around the drum kit. So we thought, what if you could trigger sounds in space without actually hitting anything? Uh, and we started having these kind of images and I would often close my eyes and listen to electronic music and go, how would I be able to play this if I had this magical device? And again, luckily for me, Mark could make this kind of stuff happen. But it took a long time because this is 2007 and sensors had not really caught up to what we have now. We tried using exoskeletons which are these things you wear that sometimes they wear in animation uh, movies to make their avatars move. Uh, we tried cameras, um, but they were pretty slow back in 2007. And finally, in 2012, we discovered this virtual reality gaming controller that we call the Razer Hydra gaming controller. And it allowed us to take the exact position of the controller relative to a hub and send that as MIDI, and I'll explain a little bit about MIDI in a moment, to the computer. And then it was all up to me to make something with that, right? So it's interesting to think about MIDI and this idea of controllers because with electronic music, the thing itself doesn't make the sound often takes some kind of uh, data from the world and we can use very different sensors to 
take data from the world. We can use sensors that tell you what the orientation of something is, or we can take data that from uh, sensors that tell you how far you are from something. You can even take data from sensors that tell you what the temperature of the room is. You just need data to, to from the real world and turn that into something that in the computer that turns into sound, that turns into music. And that's the role that I took as part of the project. Mark had done his bit. He had taken these virtual reality gaming controllers. He had built a bit of software in my computer that then spat out MIDI into another bit of software and now it was my job to make music with it. So it's 2013, I've got these gaming controllers and I've got all this imagination and I'm going, what do I do? What do I do with these? They don't make a sound, I need to program them. And this is what we call the, the mapping problem as instrument designers is this infinite amount of possibilities that open up to us when we take these controllers, when we take this data from the real world. So the first thing that kind of was a problem for me to investigate, and I investigated this through a PhD, which was an incredible opportunity, uh, was this problem that I had to do this on my own, really. I couldn't really expect to go to a band rehearsal with this instrument and sit there and go, okay, um, I don't know what this makes, what sound this makes yet, but just hang on with me. I'll just program something and, and we'll, we'll write something together. I had to really sit at home alone and get no feedback and start making music by myself that I didn't really want to make. I wanted to make music the same way I'd made it on the drum kit where I go somewhere and play with other people and we improvise a little bit, maybe decide to do something again, but that wasn't the case at first. So I had to painstakingly get through this fear of, is this good, is this bad, I've got my feedback. What I call the, the one person band dilemma of making a new instrument, of inventing a new instrument. So the first task was really, well, what sound does this make? And at this point, we came up with a name called the Air Sticks, uh, but they weren't sticks. They were these gaming controllers. And I looked to kind of a lot of my influences, a lot of my people I, I was inspired by to start to unpack what kind of sounds this instrument could make. So at first, I actually lent on the idea of room feedback. And this kind of is a nice part of the lecture for me to talk about because I can both talk about what I did but also some of the influences I have and some of the history of the way electronic music, music electronic musicians created uh, music. So room feedback is a, is a real interesting thing to use because it's different in every room and composers have used it in some great ways. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is very famous Alva Lucia piece called I'm Sitting in a Room, where he talks in the room and then plays it back through speakers in the room into the microphone and he sits there and it records for 45 minutes. This one and a half minute speech that slowly gets more and more dissolved into just room feedback. I highly recommend checking it out, it's really interesting. Uh, another maybe more physical approach to using feedback was done by Steve Reich in a piece called Pendulum Music where he would have speakers lined up on the floor and he would drop microphones on leads and they would swing past the speaker and make a little whoop feedback sound and when you had a lot of them lined up they'd all make this pattern and different pitches and it was just really interesting to watch because you have this connection between the real physical properties of these swinging objects and this electronic sound that gets produced when a microphone gets very close to a speaker. Um, probably the most famous use of feedback though is by Jimi Hendrix using his guitar on stage and just getting these incredible overtones and different sounds. So these are the kind of things that inspired me for some of my first performances, which weren't recorded because they were very experimental and 
I've enjoyed doing them, but they got me to a nice place because after I used these movements to control feedback, I could now put someone in front of that microphone and actually play with someone and sample them and play off them and throw back their sound to them through my movement, through my gestures um, and have this kind of conversation. So one short video that I'll, I'll play for you is uh, of a group called Cephalon uh, with an incredible guitarist called Kyle Sanna and this is completely improvised and I'm taking in the input from his acoustic guitar and I'm manipulating it through the movements of the Estics. So it's worth mentioning here, I'm not the first to use these kind of gestural controllers. Uh, there's been some incredible pioneers. The hands is a instrument in the 90s, I believe, that was created in the Netherlands. And I'll just get the name written underneath because I'm not good at pronouncing Polish names. So I'm going to say Michel Weischer. Uh, was very influential in Europe in making gestural controllers. And the hands, unfortunately, was something I never saw live. But I, one video I've, I've seen of his was really inspiring because he, he'd come out to the audience and have these incredible cyborg kind of things that he was wearing. And he would take a bow and everyone would clap and he would basically grab the sound of the applause and twist it and augment it and do it like a performance just using that sound for 30 seconds a minute and then he would stop and everyone would obviously applaud again and then he would grab that again and do another piece with that and it was just for me a really inspiring uh, conversation between the audience and the performer using this incredible technology. And he was using uh, granular synthesis. I don't know if that's something you've come across. And granular synthesis and other forms of synthesis was what started inspiring me with the air sticks. So in the, in the next video, I want to show you some use of the air sticks as a synthesizer. This gave me more control over all the sound. It made it more predictable because when I was working with live samples, I didn't know what the other musician might play might feed into my instrument and it meant that I could play it a bit more like like a drummer. Um, when I did sample I'd often use granular synthesis and granular synthesis like the name describes uh, uses grains or tiny segments of acoustic sound sampled and then played really really fast until it's almost unrecognizable as the original sound. Regular synthesis or additive synthesis uses sine tones or other uh, tones like square waves to generate the sound. And in this next video, 
I use a selection of different oscillators, tones that feed into each other as I move around with the airsticks. So at this part of the project, I realized that I was doing some things that I was not as comfortable doing, I guess. Live sampling, all these things that were not really my skill set. My skill set was playing drums, was, was striking and playing rhythms and playing with other people and improvising with other people. So I took on more of a role of a drummer. I, I started a band called The Sticks with two wonderful musicians, Josh Ahern on bass, and Daniel Pliner on keys. And what was really interesting about this project was how me playing the air sticks and using some pre-existing examples, some drum synthesis, and really leaning into a tradition of electronic music in the form of hip hop and I guess a bit of techno, how that influenced the way they played their instruments. And for this next piece, we took samples from one of our favorite electronic producers, Fortet, and cut them up and remixed them in a new way to uh, perform this black and white recording. So now I've got this band that I'm playing with and I'm playing my role as a drummer and I started realizing that there was other ways of actually considering how to make an instrument. I was leading with the idea of well what sound is this going to make but I actually often asked myself well what movements should I make like strikes and other gestures. So as a drummer, I leant into strikes and maybe playing a bit more like I was playing brushes sometimes. But there are other movements you can make. Um, you can stir a pot or you can punch through the air. Things that aren't related to necessarily being a drummer or acoustic drummer. So I wanted to start exploring those in a next uh, collaboration and elevate them to a solo show. And to do that, I thought I needed to give the audience something else to kind of look at, not just myself. So my partner, as in my performance partner, actually became the visuals that were coming from the air sticks. So just to recap, now we've got this controller, this virtual reality gaming controller. It knows exactly where you are in space and your orientation. It's got buttons as well that I sometimes use, as all controllers do. It was wired to a hub, and that hub would tell you exactly where you are. And that would send MIDI information through to Ableton Live, I would use often. But you can also send that same information to a visualization program. So I work with an incredible visual artist called Matthew Hughes, who started to take this information and build visualization systems of my movements and of the sound. And he would project them onto what we call a scrim. Not a screen that might sit behind me, but a scrim, a transparent screen that would sit in front of me, between me and the audience. And this was really exciting for me because it allowed me to see the audience through the visuals and if I was lit well, it allowed the audience to see the visuals floating in front of, of me. And in other performances with visuals, you'd be disconnected, but in this one, you very much felt like the visuals were part of the instrument or perhaps even a dance partner at times. So I thought I'd play a couple of videos 
from this uh, piece that's called Trigger Happy Visualize, named after a project I had with a producer called Comatone. These are a couple of pieces fr from that. My name is... Alonil And these are the air sticks. Last video I want to play to you is from the same show, but it uses drums as well. So in this practice, as you've seen, I've been pushing away from playing drums into playing the air sticks. But what was really interesting is that when I went back to the drums, it would really change the way that I would play them. Uh, and in this video, you see that I've incorporated some of the ideas of the air sticks into a drumming performance.
so that was the end of using the gaming controllers, the Razer Hydra gaming controllers as part of this project. In the next episode, I wanna reveal our new hardware that we built ourselves to be wireless uh, and to be more accessible and not to have the kind of feeling of being a gaming controller. And I'll also just unpack a little bit what's happening in those last couple of videos because there, there's a few tricks of the trade within them. Um, but I also wanted to leave you with a question. What would you do with this technology? What would you do with a device that could convert your movement into sound and visuals? Who would you want to work with? What sounds would you think it would make? What movements would you want to make? Um, I'd be really interested to see what ideas you come up with.